Hello everyone, in today's video we're going to be taking a look at a neat little thing that I thought we'd take a look at, and that is Harpoon 5. Those are the tabletop rules and command and how they can work together with each other. So just recently, this is just a few days ago, they actually put out the jumpstart rules for Harpoon 5, of course being a fan of these kinds of games, I had to scoop that sucker up right away and uh, start patrolling through it. First things first, uh, just going through this initial read of this, I was really tickled by how careful the formatting has been done, the way everything's in color and everything and the overlap between what I see in the Harpoon rules and the Command at Sea rules and all that other good stuff. So anyway, what this is basically is this is a modern naval combat game. Of course, when I think modern naval combat games, yo, this is exactly what I think of. So what they did in their little jump start is they actually provide you with a scenario that takes place in the Norwegian Sea. In this scenario, they actually have a situation that looks like this. They give you the distances, the ship names, everything. And I looked at this and I said, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Let's go try this out in Command. So what I wanted to do today is I wanted to share everybody what the actual thing would look like in command and kind of how to work your way through some of the documentation in here. Keep in mind there are other harpoon scenarios out here which you can adapt for command. I have actually done that in the past to a pretty good success. So let's go ahead and take a look at what we're dealing with here. So basically our situation is that we have an engineering casualty and we also have a really, really bad, the poor Biddle here got shot up really, really bad. So the uh, Russians, of course, or the Soviets at this particular time in 89, decided to send out a couple of the Nuchka especially with one with this new fancy radar technique, which we'll take a look at, called the Monolites, and try to track down this wounded cruiser. So the best that NATO could do at the time is basically attach an Oliver Hazard Perry frigate to this cruiser in a desperate attempt to try to get them safe and home. So that's definitely going to be an interesting kind of scenario, and uh, let's go ahead and see what we can do with that over here in command. So first things first, uh, let's make sure we are in the correct time. So they said May of 1989. So I don't exactly know what day in May, so I'm going to do the 20th. They said that the scenario starts at 900 hours. I'm assuming that's Zulu time. So I'm going to go ahead and press OK. And they said it takes place in the Norwegian Sea. So I'm going to go ahead and press OK. We're good to go. Go ahead and zoom in to Norway here for just a moment. Get a good look at that. So let's see what other details they provided for us for this particular scenario. I think they've actually given us things like weather to like really, really specific weather. Uh, let's see here. We have a little bit of stuff as far as confusion there. Uh, here we go. Bingo. Environment, uh, sun rises at 3.30, moon sets, it's a 900 hours, we got that already. Uh, let's see here, it's 48 hours, okay, we have a CV zone, visibility, no cloud cover, wind 240 at 2 knots, it's sea, okay, moderate seat, sea state 4, but that's all they give us for information. Okay, fine. So we'll go down over here to weather. Again, I don't know how cold it is in Norway this time of year, so I'm just going to put it at 10. We saw that the sea state is going to be 4, which means good luck using sonar, but it's not going to apply to us. It also, I believe, said that there were no clouds or anything along those lines. Uh, let's take a look here. Uh, that is not going to be an issue. Again, the tactical situation, you can get a copy. This is actually a free document if you want to take a look at it. Ah, so the two cutters are 10 nautical miles apart. Okay, looks good, looks good, looks good. All right, let's do it. So if we skip forward a little bit, they actually give you a little map which shows you exactly this is from a program called Simplot, which is really cool. You have this random chunk of the Norwegian coast here, and I'm uh, kind of looking at it. I don't know about you, but if that's north-south, it's going to tell me that it's going to be somewhere in this zone here. I'm guessing the whole scenario probably takes place around here. And if I also recall correctly, there was a piece in the rules here that stated that there's the potentiality of mines if you get too close to the shore. So I'm kind of getting the feeling that maybe we should take care of that first, then add all the ships. So let's go ahead and do that first. So I'm going to add edit sides. Uh, we'll go ahead and say Soviet Union as one of our sides here. We'll go grab the other one. We'll call it NATO. Of course, you want to always edit your postures. Make sure they're set correctly. We're going to set them to hostile. We're going to set this one to hostile as well. Uh, we have no rules of engagement, so I'm not going to worry about that. I'll swing over to Soviet Union. Again, the whole scenario is going to be taking place along this coast here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to measure out about five nautical miles. Let's do four. That looks good. I'm going to go ahead and create a zone and go ahead and create some handy dandy little mines here in case the uh, NATO player decides to kind of play it reckless. Uh, let's go ahead and pull that out here. Again, this is just representing the fact that the Soviets would have been mining this whole zone at all times. I'm actually going to bring this out just a teeny tiny bit. I know that's beyond five nautical miles, but oh well. So we're going to go down to the minefields feature, which is always fun. Create new designated area. So we can decide what kind of mine we're going to be using. I'm a fan of a broadband fuse bottom mine. This seems to work pretty well. Uh, let's just take a shot at this. Oh no, you have to. There we go. Come on. Let's do it. 100. Boop. Oh, that sucks. Try again. Again. Again, again, again. 
Okay, so that's going to annoy an awful lot of fishermen when this war is over, but we'll deal with it. Okay, let's deal with the Soviet side first. So if I recall correctly, we have two Nanuchkas. Let's see here. Uh, ba -ba -ba, scroll down to this section. Ah, here we are. We have Project 1234.1 Nanuchka 3s. Okay, a pair of Nanuchka 3s. And we know that they're 60.7 nautical miles away from the NATO forces. So I'm just going to go ahead and pick a spot. I'll put them right here. Go ahead, surface ship. I'm going to go ahead and type in Nanuchka. And we're going to be using Nanuchka 3s. Uh, let's see here. What version of the Nanuchka 3 are they using? I believe they're going to be using the 89 version. We don't have the 89 version, but we do have this version right here. Uh, that looks pretty good to me. Let's go ahead and call up the database entry. just want to take a look real fast. Make sure we have the correct weapon. Uh, we have Tintinit which is not going to be the type of sensing system we're going to need on board. Kind of a bummer. But we do have P-120s. Good. That's going to be one of our ships. And we'll go ahead. They said it was 10 nautical miles apart. So I'm going to separate them by about 10 nautical miles. Obviously, don't get too close to this coast. You know it's by the coast. 10 nautical miles right here. And I'll make a copy. And let's see if there's any other special things they've asked us to do here. Ah, bingo. It looks like one of them has the Tintinit, and the other one has the Monolith T. It also looks like we have the OSA MA on one of them and the regular OSA on the other one. So how are we going to deal with that? So let's go ahead and see which one of these ships has what. I'm just going to go up to the tippy top here. Again, I'm just reading what they have here. The Iceberg is the one with the Tintinit system. So Iceberg, go ahead and grab that one. Let's call him the Iceberg. Boop. There we go. We have the Iceberg. And that one has the Dubrava Tatinit. Okay, to do that, I'm going to go to Sensors. Let's see what we have on board already. We already have the Tatinit system. So I'm going to leave it exactly the way it is. I don't need to change anything. It doesn't have the OSA M or anything. It is the OSA M. Okay, then we're fine. So the rest of it, which is the Dawn, this one's a little different. According to this, it has the new monolith system. So we're definitely going to have to rename this one. And we're, of course, going to have to throw that system on. Let's go to Sensors. Let's go ahead and cut out the bandstand here. Let's scroll down to bandstand. Let's click on add sensor, filter by keyword. And what do we need here? We need to call this one, uh, let's see here. This is monolith, mono. Lit. Okay, so we have a bunch of different elements here. Uh, one method you could use is you could use just this one here, which is actually a sensor group. That's what these are. But just for my sake, I'm going to go ahead and add them all individually here like this, including the passive element. Just to confirm that they work that way. Beautiful. All right, everything is set and ready to go for these two ships. Actually, wait a minute. No, it isn't. One of them also has the OSA MA. So we need to modify this one real quick so that it has an OSA MA. Let's do that. Cool. Let's go to mount some weapons. Let's add a mount. Let's see if we can get the OSA M A S A N four bingo right there. Go ahead, throw that in there. Don't forget to delete the old one. It's not very fair. Move mount, and now of course we have a problem because we have some ammunition issues that we need to consider. Magazines. Uh, what do we have here? Okay, so it looks like we are good to go with that already. Excellent. Excellent, because the mount has its own magazine on board. Man, that was easy. So now we're good to go for the Soviet uh, forces here. We'll call these uh, Soviet rocket cutters. That's what they called it in the description. Now, do we have any knowledge on what speed they're traveling at or anything along those lines? You always want to go ahead and take a look at standing orders that they give them to you. Let's see here. Both seems at 180 degrees at 24 knots, at least 15 nautical miles away from the coast. Okay, I can see why they want to stay 15 nautical miles away. Beautiful. Okay, so I'm just going to basically, they said 180 is going to be their course. We're going to have them steam at 180, just like they say. Set their speed up to full. We need to get these guys up to 24 knots, though. So we're going to go ahead and back them down from full in just a moment. And we are good to go. These two ships are now ready. Let's go ahead and take a look at the NATO forces now. Switch to NATO. Now, according to that original picture, they were 60.7 nautical miles away. So let's go ahead and get that all set up. They're going to be right here. Remember, though, they're all going to be about five nautical miles off the coast, which is going to put them basically right here. Okay, so we have the Belknap, B-E-L-K-N-A-P, but I believe this is a certain version of it. Let's go take a look real quick. Let's see here. This is, the, it's a Belknap, it's the Biddle, CG-34. 
CG 34 bit biddle. Now, according to this scenario, the Biddle actually already received several anti-ship missiles in the side of it. So unfortunately, it's going to be in rough shape. So according to their stuff here, I believe, let's see here, he's got half of his health left. He has no sensors except for his little the navigational radar. He has no control over his weapon mounts. So let's go ahead and set that up now. So the first thing's first. Uh, let's go ahead and get rid of all of these. I'm going to grab all those, set them to damaged. Our magazines, I'm not going to worry about magazines. Sensors, the only one we're allowed is basically going to be the navigation sensor for short range surface. That's going to be our SPS 49. I'll go set these to destroyed or damaged, I should say. All of these sensors are going to be damaged as well. Obviously, eyeballs still work. Radios and stuff like that, we're not going to worry about, but we do know that the bridge and CIC have been damaged badly. And we also know that our engines have been badly damaged as well, and our total health is about 50. Ouch, this thing has definitely seen better days. Now, according to the text here we cannot exceed eight knots which is it's that's not great because those in the neutrals will catch up to us eventually but we have a trump card so i'm not too too worried about that so now that's all set i believe our escort is a parry let's see here parry 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 oliver hazard parry i believe this particular one is let's see here who do we have we have the doyle cool so i let's go double check what distance they had apart real fast uh let's see if their standing orders are because standing orders are very important here Let's go take a look. Uh, Soviet, uh, five nautical miles. They were going to be doing eight knots. Uh, they're going to be doing 315 at five nautical miles. Okay, so that is going to be 315 at five nautical miles. 315, 315, 315 at five nautical miles is right here. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and add the parry. In this case, I'm going to use the Underwood as my basis. They said it was the 1989 version. Let's go ahead and rename it. Uh, this is FFG. Let's take a look at which one it is. Again, I want to move quickly here so you guys have an opportunity to actually see what this looks like in action and kind of see how you can convert these over. Let's see here. Uh, we've got an engineering casualty, so it's going to limit our top speed as well. Uh, we have the OHA. We are the Doyle. FFG 39 Doyle. 39 oil and we had an engineering casualty so we have to actually go to damage control we have to go down to our engines and we have to lightly damage them unfortunately i can't damage them well if that makes sense and we'll assume it's five percent damage okay we are all set with this i'm just going to confirm one more thing before we get rolling for the scenario itself now i see what weapons we have on board i believe we have sm1 mrs sm1 mr beautiful and obviously, this one's got the nice missiles, but we can't use them because everything is basic. I believe it took a CIC hit, so it's busted. We have the Harpoon 1C. We have the Harpoon... Oh, this is awesome. Again, I love it when both of the databases actually agree with each other because it saves a lot of frustration. Let's see. We have a gun director. Sounds good. And we have a single SH-60B Seahawk, which is honestly, it is our trump card. SH-60B, it's going to be the 1987 version. We get one. We better name this thing... Let's call it the trump card. You know what? Why not? So we have the trump card. We'll go ahead into here. Ready arm. We'll go ahead and give this a uh, long range loadout because you know I'm going to be using it for. All right. Looks good. Looks good. Make sure these guys are grouped together. USSAG. According to the standing orders, we're supposed to be traveling away from the danger zone. And we're also, of course, supposed to be doing only eight knots, which is kind of a bummer. We're going to say the safe zone is going to be somewhere here. We want to hug the coast as best we can and preferably not drive into the side of the mines. But yeah, you do what you got to do. Manual override. Eight knots looks pretty good to me, actually. Eight knots. Set it cruise cruise for eight beautiful fortunately there's no submarines in this scenario so we don't have to worry about that aspect okay so that is the setup i'm just going to confirm one more time visually uh let's scroll down here yep this is all set this is all set okay i'm liking this this isn't bad this takes a lot shorter time than it takes to draw out all those things by the way I'm not making a judgment on any of these games here but you, know, you have to be aware of that sometimes there's definitely some time considerations there all right copy date i'm not going to put any events or anything like that in because i just don't need to save as uh harpoon five scenario uh what do we want to call this let's give it an actual name jump start scenario jump starts all right, Poon 5, jump start. Beautiful. All right, we're now ready to play the scenario. So we'll play this from NATO's side. It'd be really fun to try to play it from the Soviet side, but 
it wouldn't be difficult to lose here. But well, let's let, let's see what we, they actually did in this scenario here. So I believe they went ahead and turned their radars on an hour later. They did that for about three minutes, couldn't find anything. It did tell the U.S., however, that there's an ESM warning, which is good, which is good. So let's see here. Then the SH-60 uses passive detection. Uh, of course, the Soviets did manage to detect both the helicopter as well as the two ships. Hey, look at that. It looks just like ours. That's so cool. So let's see here. We got a, some pretty good things. We're able to acquire it. We also used its radar to confirm their positions. Let's see here. They went ahead and rotated the ships to make it easier to take a shot. It looks like we're getting some harpoon launches, but I promise you these guys are returning fire with S-120s. I'd be disappointed if they weren't. Yeah. Oh, my God. Those are big missiles. They're so big. Okay, so that's what those are. So those are both scooting out. We got four harpoons on the way, and we have 12 P120s. Oh, this is going to end terribly. So let's see here. Everyone moves 30 seconds. They move 30 seconds. The harpoon passes the P120s. I believe they get a little mission here where they're going to be launching their chaff and everything like that. So let's see here. Yeah, I think it's pretty obvious how this one ends. Oh, boy, this is going to end badly. Okay, so the Doyle is probably hoed. Okay, so they're trying to shoot down the incoming P-120s. Looks like they got one, two, six of them total. So one of them, yeah, is going to snap the poor Perry in half. Wah, wah. And it looks like the Harpoons did a darn good job, too, and be able to dent up our cutters as well. Interesting. So now that we know what it looks like in the actual paper and pencil game, let's try it here, shall we? All right. Begin. All right, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and get the trump card airborne. This is exactly the same thing as they did in their scenario. It's going to be the exact same thing that I'm going to do in this scenario. Unfortunately, we are in so much trouble if they manage to get a good lock on us. So we've got to cross our fingers we can get out of here way before they can. Now, remember, they didn't start emitting until 10 o'clock. But I know those sneaky Soviets are out there somewhere. So I'm going to throw them for a loop. And I'm actually going to head out to sea and do one of these kinds of things at about, yeah, we'll just say cruise. And my concept here is that I'm going to be listening for their ESM blasts first, and second is I'm going to throw them off as to what my actual position is. Now remember, according to the actual document, they didn't start emitting until about 10 o'clock. So I'm going to hold tight here and actually go this way. Now if I wanted to, I could start emitting my actual helicopter itself. The advantage to this technique is the fact that unless they're 10 feet away from me, which is just embarrassing, they can't really engage a helicopter at real ranges. So there's really no reason for me not to do this. All right. Oh, look at that. We have two targets. Let's go ahead and get a little bit closer here. And we're working out the identification problem next. So we have a pretty good idea of their speed. They're moving very fast, which tells me they're not civilian, especially if they're fairly large. The bad news here is that we can't go in here and like get actual details until we get physically close enough. But we do want to get physically close enough to visually confirm exactly what we see. Now remember, these guys don't emit until 9.57. Looks like they're struggling a little bit to try to get into position there. I'll have to edit this scenario a little later on before releasing it so they don't get so stuck. All right, we've got to get a little bit closer than that. Let's go ahead and shut the radar off. Do one of these things. I'm going to do a quick little leg. Because remember, his position was about here. The reason for this leg, of course, is so that I prevent them from being able to uh, lock stuff on there. Remember, they're not emitting right now to lock onto me. There we go. Bingo. We got a visual on this one, and I'm really hoping we get a visual on this one in a second. So if he's there, the other one's got to be over here somewhere. All right, that's a pretty. They're moving really fast. I don't want to turn my radar. Oh, there it is. Bingo! You guys are silly. All right. So now we have two unidentified. Uh, they're PCFGs. We don't have any PCFGs, so I'm going to mark them both as hostile. And I'm just going to hang out here. Remember, they don't emit until 10 o'clock. So our problem here is the fact that look at our kill range with our particular missiles. In this case, the Harpoon. Hey, look, we've identified them. Yes! I'm going to get a little bit further away here. So we can't launch at them until they get into this range. So they have a pretty confident feel that we're going to be down here somewhere. Granted, I was smart enough to use my helicopter off to the side. So I could technically be over here somewhere. So we need to think this through super carefully. Because if we get within their range and they can find us with their radars, we're both going to blindside each other. And it's going to be terrible. The other problem I have is this helicopter right now here. Let's see how much fuel he's got. He's only got two hours of fuel left. So I can't keep him up in the air forever. So we got to think this, oh boy, I hate modern 
missile combat because basically the first one to run out of interceptors loses because if we fire i promise you they will fire right down that bearing at us and they'll probably get us anyway the harpoon i believe do you get any waypoints on a harpoon let me see what we have for waypoints here do we get waypoints uh we are bearing only launch which is wonderful uh we are not a waypoint weapon bummer a waypoint weapon simply means we could tell the missiles to go actually over here and then cut back across and nail them, or we could launch them out to sea and then cut across. Of course, the smart player will actually launch them in both directions simultaneously, plus one down the middle, so that they basically create an impossible situation where they can't turn their ship to be able to intercept the incoming missiles. So uh, right now we're at a bit of an impasse. In the actual scenario itself, you're supposed to be entering air cover, finger quotes, you can't see that right now. But uh, the, trust me, the finger coats are there. So if we can get into that air cover, you know, we'd be safe and win the scenario. The problem is they'll catch up to us no matter what because they're making such good time here. And again, they won't start emitting for another 15 minutes. So I'm actually going to order my guy to come down to creep speed. Get as low as you can and go creeping. Or loiter. There we go. Let's go. So he's going to come down. Travel nice and low. It's also going to annoy the heck out of those guys. Speed up time to 57 is where it said in the scenario where they're going to start emitting. So go ahead and switch to the Soviet side real quick. Again, they have a pretty good idea there's a helicopter over there, but they're not turning their radars on yet. All right, you guys are making good speed here. Kick it up a notch, will you? You're taking forever. Go ahead and skip time just a teeny, teeny, tiny bit here so that they're up to the speed they need to be. And it is time for them to emit their radars in just a few moments. Now remember, I've already acquired them. So it's like, it doesn't matter. Radar on. Aha! Look at that. We've spotted both of these vessels. Both of them. This is actually exactly what happens over here, by the way. Now, for those of you guys who are experts, you're going to be throwing out the fact, how the heck can they detect them with a surface radar at a distance of, look at this, a distance of 43 nautical miles. And the reason is, is because it's using that new advanced radar system. Now, here's the problem we have now. If neither one of these ships emits, I can't actually identify who they are. But in our particular situation, let's go ahead and end this properly. Uh, let's see here. We have not identified them. It's going to take us another 23 seconds to launch. I believe they did six and six. So we're going to locate all. Skunk number three is going to get all. And we're going to go ahead and let them rip. And that's game over. <laughs> oh, that's game over. I am so bummed. These guys aren't even going to know what hit them. Even if I were to like flick his radar on. Oh, there they are. Oh, yeah. That's that's game over. That That's the definition of game over. You can try. It's not going to work, though. It, oh, the Doyle's trying. The Doyle's trying. Keep trying. Oh, boy. Oh, ow. Oh, ow, that hurts. Oh, ouch. Oh, oh. Do, 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 do. Oop, I shouldn't be whistling anything. Play too much Golden Eyes, a kid. So unfortunately, in this situation, it's basically unwinnable because of that superior radar system that could identify us. Now, or I should say, notice us, not identify. If this were an issue of identification, this would have been much more challenging. As long as we never emitted our radars, we could technically never be identified. So that was kind of an interesting thing. And again, if you go to the actual Harpoon 5 rules here, you can see the fact that it... it it didn't end well, but again, we never got in range of a regular harpoon, so there's just no way in the universe we're going to win this scenario safely. Again, if you played as the Soviets, you pretty much won this one automatically. That cruiser just could not defend itself. And hopefully you found this kind of interesting. Now, on the flip side, if I had penguins, or I had those TASMs, the Tomahawk anti-ship missiles, or maybe I had some air support, this would have been a very different scenario. But the fact of the matter is, there's simply nothing we can do because of that incredible detection range of that particular Nanushka system. Anyway, I'll go ahead and post this scenario down uh, below in the comments if you guys want to try to do a little better. Between now and then, of course, I'm going to go through. i got to clean up. There's a little bit of an issue with speed up here I need to kind of fix. And the other thing I want to do, too, is put in proper vents. And I also want to go through and, you know, kind of put in at exactly 10 o'clock to turn their radars on and make sure all those little details are accurate. Plus, you know, keeping final score and everything along those lines. Anyway, hopefully this was helpful. It's just kind of a way that you can build scenarios and edit 
weapons and edit sensors and everything like that. And it's kind of fun. I think the scenario would have been a little different if we could somehow hide behind, like, in one of these fjords or something. Maybe that would have been the strategy. But remember, look at how many mines we placed. So, again, it's worthwhile thinking about those things when you guys are playing your own strategy for these particular games. So, without a doubt, a Harpoon 5 is pretty cool. At the same time, Command is great, and they go together perfectly, and uh, hopefully you guys enjoy.